Welcome to Nazarene Israel. My name is Norman Willis, and it's the 2nd of April, 2021. And this week's presentation is not The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Instead, it's Josephus, the Talmud, and the Omer. And along the way, we're going to talk about the curious, curious history of the Aviv barley in 2021 CE. We could also entitle this presentation, Why Do Devorah's Date Tree and the Equinox Calendar People Not Seem to Care That We Have Broken and Shattered Barley Already on the Ground At Least Two Weeks and Two Days, Actually Closer to a Month, Prior to Their Wave Sheaf Offering on the 4th of April, 2021, Which Is Two Days From Now. Or We Could Also Entitle This Presentation, If the Karaites Don't Believe in the Talmud, why do the Karaites secretly follow the Talmud? Please join us for this presentation. Welcome to Nazarene Israel. My name is Norman Willis, and I'm the Apostle for Nazarene Israel. And just to give you some background on my history with the Aviv Barley, I initially trained with the Karaites back in 2002, 2003, when I was first introduced to the Aviv Barley calendar. And I have followed the Aviv Barley fairly closely ever since that point in time. And there was a big change in the way that the Karaites reckoned the barley around 2016. Uh, they changed the way they reckoned the Aviv barley, and they didn't tell anyone. Well, there was a big ruckus, and uh, it seems like it's a big problem every year. And so I've been praying on this. And in 2019 or 2020, the junction of those two years, Yahweh showed me some new things about how the Aviv barley should be reckoned. And apparently he showed a lot of other people also, because a lot of people are arriving at the same conclusion. So last year, we used a sister, Becca Bitterman, for our Aviv Barley reports because she happened to have reports that agreed with our understanding of the Aviv Barley. So then this year, which actually began in December of 2020, on December the 24th, Sister Bitterman found three sections of advanced barley near where she lives in Poria Elite in Israel. Now, I don't know if you can see this, but the barley here, the barley is in bloom. If you can see those little white flecks, those are actually barley, that's barley flowering. So in this generated a lot of discussion. And so this led to this and that led to that. And we spoke with Becca Bitterman and had a lot of discussion. We created a video called Aviv Barley Simplified to explain these things. And if you haven't seen that video, I recommend that you watch it. It explains the whole thing. But two of the main things that we explain in that video is we explain why the wave sheaf or the Omer is symbolic of Yeshua. We explain that the Omer or the wave sheaf must be offered before the harvest. That way Yahweh is pleased and Yahweh then blesses the harvest and sets it apart. The reason why that pleases Yahweh is precisely because the Omer is symbolic of Yeshua. So this sets the pattern for us. The pattern that we see is first we bring the Omer, then we can bring in our harvest. So first the one and then the other. And there's other groups that don't believe that. Other groups believe that you bring in the harvest and then you bring an anti-sheaf of that barley to the priest. But that doesn't work. And we're going to see a lot of reasons why that doesn't work. Because of questions over that, we made a video, let's not break Deuteronomy 16 and verse 9. And in that video, we explain why it is so very necessary to bring the very first sheaf of Aviv, which we define as medium dough barley, as the Omer, so that the barley farmers with the earliest ripening crops will not lose their crops. And this is so important. If you don't understand this point, you need to watch that video and also Aviv Barley Simplified until you do get that point. Just for example, and there's a lot of people who are in rebellion against this. Uh, and I apologize. I don't mean to name names. Anybody can make mistakes. But 
we need to be getting together as a barley community. We need to be moving on on this issue. Uh, there's a few particular groups that are in rebellion against this. I would like to point out so the very simple fact that we had Aviv barley spotted in the land of Israel on the 6th of February. Then we had a second patch of Aviv barley spotted in the land on the 22nd of February. Actually, there was a third patch we'll talk about in just a little bit that was spotted. Well, it wasn't noticed in well, I'm not exactly sure how Sister Bitterman did that, but in any event, we had three fields of barley, three witnesses to the Aviv barley spotted in the month of February. And with those, we need to offer a wave sheaf offering on the 28th of February, because the very next opportunity is all the way on the 4th of April, two days from now. But the problem is, look at this. So we had this barley here that was ready on the 6th of February, uh, that basically would have been shattered. It, the field was bulldozed, which was too bad, but that would have been shattered and on the ground about a month later. Once you reach the Aviv stage, you've got two or three weeks to bring in the harvest. By the fourth week, you are losing that harvest. The barley is shattering. It is going on the ground. Then we had these fields here that were two fields were found around the 22nd of February and sister Bitterman inspected those on the 19th of March, the day before the equinox, the day before it was officially spring. And that barley was already shattered. We'll talk a little about a little bit more about this, but amazing. Surprisingly, we still have these other groups, Devorah's date tree, Abib of God. We haven't even begun to talk about Abib of God. We've had to talk about the other calendars first, and then we'll hopefully get to them soon. Uh, they've got some very complicated things going on. But also the Equinox people, they're all waiting to do a wave sheaf offering two days from now. Friends, brothers, we already have barley shattered on the ground on the 19th of March. And if the first field had not been bulldozed, we would have had barley shattered and on the ground by the 6th of March. And here it is. They're wanting the barley. They don't want to offer a wave sheaf until a month later. That doesn't work. So we kept going. We made another video called Where is Spring Commanded? And in that video, we explained that we are not commanded to wait until spring before holding the Passover and the wave sheaf. In other words, it doesn't need to be spring it doesn't need to be warm, spring, sunny weather for the barley to be aviv. Barley can come, barley is a very hardy, robust plant. Barley can come aviv, barley can come ripe when the weather is still cold. So in Yohanan or John chapter 18 and verse 18, it says, Now the servants and officers who had made a fire of coals stood there, for it was cold. And they warmed themselves. And Kepha, or Peter, stood with them, and he warmed himself. So what this tells us is it doesn't have to be spring. It doesn't have to be past the spring equinox. It doesn't have to be warm in order to hold the Passover and the wave sheaf. That's myth. That doesn't exist in reality. That's things that people have made up that have traditions that have come into being over time that have no correspondence to Scripture. So with that in mind, now we want to take a look at what's happening with the Aviv barley harvest this year, and we'll see how things get curiouser and curiouser. So the barley that Sister Bitterman found to be in flower on the 24th of December, give it about six more weeks, and on the 6th of February, 2021, Becca Bitterman cited at least an omer of Aviv barley near Poria Elite in Israel. And this right here, if you can see, when the barley is still green, it's still young, it's still immature, but it's starting to turn this golden color. That's when you inspect it, and that's when you hope to find uh, what we call a Aviv or medium dough. Now, you only need a wave sheaf. You don't need a whole field of it You only because you only need to bring one sheaf. And this is in contrast to some of these other groups that are looking for harvestable fields. And in particular, let me mention this first before we transition, uh, this requires, if you're going to see barley like this on the 6th of February, 
then you need to declare that 28 February wave sheaf date because this barley will not make it until April the 4th. This barley will not make it until April the 4th. There's no possible way. It can't make it. That's, that's just too long in the head. So now, curiouser and curiouser. Five days later, Devor's date tree, they're a, they claim to be an interfaith search, barley search group, uh, barley and new moon search group, but they have Karaite theology. So they're looking for a different thing. They're looking for a whole field or more. In fact, they're looking for harvestable fields, plural. They want to see a lot of barley be ripe before they're willing to declare the Aviv. So five days later, just after Becca Bitterman has been there, here comes Devorah's date tree. They know exactly how to find the field. They know exactly where to park. They know all kinds of things. But they inspected the exact same field. It's about the uh, size of two football fields. And they claimed that they could not find Aviv barley. So now this was uh, very surprising to us. I was very surprised by this. Uh, Becca Bitterman, she contacted me. She was very upset. Her feeling was that unless someone was intentionally closing their eyes to the barley, you couldn't help but find the Aviv barley in that field. Um, I'm going to leave it there. I don't want to say anything more than that, but what we found, so we published our report. So I did a very extensive interview with Sister Bitterman. We must have spent, I don't know how many hours. So, uh, you know, when, when someone is claiming that another barley observer has made a false witness, that is a very, very serious charge. And uh, I didn't want to take part in a false charge. So I spent several hours, I don't know, three, four, maybe five hours speaking with Sister Bitterman and trying to basically disprove her witness. And I was not able to do so after having reviewed the photographic evidence for however, four hours, maybe five, something like that. Uh, I was not able to conclude anything other than that somebody didn't want to see the Aviv barley in that field. Now, I don't know that, but uh, it sure seemed difficult to miss from the evidence that I saw. So we then, based on that, published a report called, Was the Karyite Aviv Barley Report Impartial? And of course, as you might suspect, Devorah's date tree wrote to demand of us that we take the video down, which we did, but not without protest. And so you can go here, here's the URL. We wrote an open letter to Devorah's date tree regard to her email, video takedown, and talking with her, asking her some basic questions. How could you miss the barley in a field that's only the size of two football or two soccer fields? How could anyone miss that barley? You take a look at, at the, the picture here. So you know, the, the patch in question, it's about 100 yards from the base of the hill. Why did you only inspect at the base of the hill? Why didn't you come down to where the Aviv barley was shown? You can see the whole field from any point in the field. I mean, there was a particular point at which she was standing. You could stand at that point and I could look at the video evidence. I could look in the video on my screen, thousands and thousands, well, thousands of miles away, I could see the Aviv barley. Why couldn't she? She didn't answer our questions. So that was very interesting to us. So I encourage you, uh, it's on the Nazarene Israel website, to search for the open letter to Devorah's date tree video takedown. A very interesting, curiouser and curiouser story. So, uh, we don't want to accuse anyone falsely, so we re-recorded the interview with Sister Sister Becca Bitterman, and we published the basically the same information with different packaging, uh, Becca as Becca Bitterman's barley field confirmed, and we have yet to hear back from Devorah's date tree. We also, I should add, uh, we also asked Devorah's date tree to take down their video which stated that there was no Aviv barley in that field, or at the very least, that they could not find Aviv barley in that field because we have ample photo and video evidence. How can anyone say there's not 
anyway, let me leave it there. I don't want to say the wrong thing. Uh, I don't want to get anyone in trouble. Um, we're just going to leave it there. <laughs> but so then we have give it 10 more days and sister, I guess, well, yeah. All right. So 15, I'm not sure how many days. So yeah, 10 more days on to the 21st and 22nd of February, on the 21st of February, sister Becca Bitterman and her assistant, Cindy, they harvested a bucket of barley out of the Poria elite field at which, uh, so, okay. So it's 15 more days from the, uh, it was a Vive on the 6th of February. And then on the 15th of February, so that's two weeks. So from the time the barley was a Vive, it was two weeks and a day. And now we've got a Vive. Well, the Aviv barley had turned into harvest ready barley and they took a bucket out to prove it. And then the next day on the 22nd, they also found a second field of Aviv barley in Raim, Israel. And as it turns out, there was a third field that we found about later. So Sister Bitterman is very busy. She's scouring the land looking for barley. She found a third field in Migdala, which is also near the Sea of Galilee, or what they call the Kinneret. So we had three witnesses to the Aviv barley this year. Well, wonder of wonders, lo and behold, give it a little bit more time. And uh, so we come from the 21st of February, 22nd of February, give it about 10 more days. And Devor's date tree comes in again, inspects the same field right behind Becca in Raim, Israel. The exact same field, knows exactly how to find it. Wonders, curious. She doesn't see the first flush of barley, which had been a Aviv. I guess I'm saying eight days earlier, because why? Because it had already fallen over. This is what Aviv Barley does. This is why Yeshua says that when the crop is ripe, immediately the wise farmer puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. Because if you don't put in the sickle right away, that barley falls over and it loses its seed. That's the whole point. So people can make up hypothetical theories about how the barley doesn't lose its seed. It does it does lose its seed. Don't let anyone tell you different. That's one of the characteristics of barley. It loses its seed. So uh, basically, if you, if you inspect, if you, if you watch those videos from that point in time, you can, you can see the first flush, the early of Eve barley had already fallen over and already lost its seed. And she walks right past it. And she's focusing on the second flush of barley, which of course was still green. So why is this happening? I don't know. The best thing I can think of is she's looking for something else. As a karyite, she's looking for what they call harvestable fields. They're not looking to bring the first sheaf, symbolic of Yeshua. They're looking to bring whole harvestable fields, and then they're going to bring an anti-sheaf of that harvest. It's a very different doctrine. That's why Yeshua says to beware of the leaven, meaning the doctrine of the scribes and the Pharisees is because you're expecting something different, so it leads to a different result. Okay, so moving on. Well, uh, in her video report, uh, along with her video report, Devorah's Date Tree, they also, Devorah Gordon, she also published, she says, now this is where it starts to get very interesting. We're, we're asking ourselves, why is all this happening? What is going on? Why is this, you know, we, we, we're writing to them, we're asking them questions. We're not getting answers. What's going on? What's happening? So she says in her report, she says, also, it has always been understood that there was no prohibition against the farmers harvesting when needed. Meaning you can break Deuteronomy 16 and verse nine, just so long as you don't eat of the crop. She says they only needed to wait until Yom Hanafat Omer or the day of the wave sheaf offering before eating of the produce. Okay, so I didn't understand that because to me, as I take a look at things, Deuteronomy 16.9 is a very big prohibition against harvesting early. So Devarim or Deuteronomy 16, starting in verse 9 says, You shall count seven weeks for yourself. Begin to count the seven weeks from the time you begin to put the sickle to the standing grain. 
then you shall keep the Feast of Weeks, or Shavuot, or Pentecost, to Yahweh your Elohim. Now to us, it's very simple. What he's saying is, when you begin the count, that's when you begin to put the sickle to the standing grain. Or, if you prefer, when you begin cutting, you begin counting. Or when you begin counting, that's when you can begin cutting. And then seven weeks later, that's your feast. It's a very simple equation. But Devorah's date tree insists that, no, you can start cutting without beginning the count. And that it's always been done that way. So why is she saying that? So the mystery is getting thicker. Well, so we made another video called Shattered Barley and Migdala. And on the 19th of March, Becca Bitterman found lots of broken and shattered barley in Migdala, Israel. And this was the day before the spring equinox on the 20th of March. So 19th of March, 20th of March. Here's a picture of the shattered barley. This is exactly what you don't want. This is exactly what you're trying to avoid is barley being on the ground. So, I mean, that's the whole point of a wave sheaf offering is to clear the way for the harvest so that this kind of thing doesn't happen. So here we have, we have broken and shattered barley on the ground at least two weeks and two days before the Karaite wave sheaf offering on the 4th of April, 2021. Now, Take, take a moment to conceptualize this. This is what we're talking about right here. So here we've got Aviv Barley. We saw the picture. It was cited on the 6th of February. And then we had another field in Ra'im that was cited to be Aviv on the 22nd of February. There was another field in, uh, uh, where was it? Migdala, which was also cited about the same time. Becca said that it was about two weeks behind the first field. So add two weeks, which would be 14 days. So it'd be about 20 days. So it's about the same time. So we had effectively three witnesses to the Aviv barley. All of these three witnesses call for a wave sheaf offering here on the 28th of February. Why? Because they won't manage to stay in the head until the 4th of April, two days from now. It can't happen. So here, this barley that was Aviv, actually the, the third field that was Aviv on the 20th, it was shattered here. It was, was it the 6th of March? Let me take a look. Uh, what am I? No, all right. So this is what we're saying. So we're saying, let me get my mouse back here. So here you have the Aviv barley that was, should have been in uh, Migdala, should have been Aviv about the 20th. Here it is shattered a month later. So what we're saying is you have about two or three weeks to harvest your barley once it becomes Aviv. If you don't harvest your barley once it becomes Aviv, you're going to lose it because it becomes shattered. So here's the barley on Poria Elite. It would have been shattered about here, about a month later, about the 6th of March. Here was the field that was about two weeks behind it in Migdala. And it was shattered about just less than a month later. This is all before your spring equinox. So here we have all these equinox people saying, oh no, you have to wait for the equinox. You have to wait for the equinox. Hello? Knock, knock, knock. You mean, is anyone home? I mean, this is what we're trying to avoid. You've got shattered barley on the ground. You need to avoid that. Why, why is this such a problem? Why people cannot understand you need to avoid having shattered barley on the ground. So you've got shattered barley right here. Excuse me. Well, we would have had shattered barley here. We've had two more fields of shattered barley here. And yet a beeb of God, we haven't even talked about them yet. Devorah's date tree and the equinox people, they're all calling for a wave sheaf on the 4th of April. Unbelievable. Okay, we publish another video. Where is the equinox commanded in Scripture? So we explain that the equinox doesn't exist in Scripture. The word doesn't exist in Scripture. Therefore, the equinox cannot be the determining factor. You've got the barley shattering and on the ground before the equinox. The equinox cannot be the determining factor. Hello, hello, Earth to equinox people. The equinox cannot be the determining factor. Okay, 
I don't know how much clearer we can make it. I'm sure we're still going to get hate mail because the Equinox basically is a demon. Uh, You can show them all the evidence you want and you're going to get complaints, protests, angry emails, nasty grams, whatever you want to call them. You can show them you've got barley on the ground. They don't care. You have to wait until after the Equinox because fill in the blank. Okay, well, whatever. (laughs) That's really, I mean, pray, pray with us for them because this is a demon that they have. And if you want more information about that, I can encourage you to read Nazarene Scripture Studies, Volume 2. It's called The Equinox Error. There's also another study in there called The Lunar Sabbath Error. I recommend both of those studies to people who are focused on the equinox or the lunar Sabbath. It shows the reasons why they cannot work. Well, here we are. Here's the commandment from Yahweh. What are we going to do? So he says, begin to count the seven weeks from the time you begin to put the sickle to the standing grain. Begin to count when you begin to cut. You can begin to cut when you begin counting. First, you bring the wave sheaf, then you may harvest your crops. It's very simple. Well, there was another ancient Israelite who agreed and said the same thing. Now, it's a very interesting man. Flavius Josephus, he was born Yosef ben Matityahu. He was the son of a priest and also of a noblewoman. So she was from the royal line, from the line of kings. And he was educated. He was multilingual. He was a war general. He was a historian. Uh, Some people love him, some people hate him, but he wrote a lot of historical works that have a lot of very good value to them. He lived approximately from 37 to about 100 CE. Now that's during the Second Temple era because the Second Temple was destroyed in the year 70. So he knew what happened in the first century in the Second Temple era. So he was born around 37. So he was born around seven years after Yeshua's sacrifice. So he was an eyewitness to how things were done in that time. Now, we've also, as long as we're here, we might as well mention there's a thing called the Testimonium Flavianum. Uh, Again, a lot of people uh, are for it. A lot of people against it. The Orthodox obviously don't like it. It's found in Josephus, Antiquities of the Jews, Book 18, chapter 3, and verse 3. So if this passage is to be believed, and many people believe it is to be believed, other people are completely against it, he says, About this time there lived Yeshua, a wise man, if indeed one ought to call him a man. For he was one who performed surprising deeds and was a teacher of such people as accept the truth gladly. He won over many Jews, meaning the Pharisees, and many of the Greeks, today what we'd call a Reformed Jew. He was the Messiah. So also in Antiquities of the Jews, book 3, chapter 10, and verse 5, Josephus talks about the wave sheaf offering. So he says, And they offer the first fruits of their barley, and that in the following manner. They take a handful of the ears, meaning you don't need that many. That's what you don't need harvestable fields. You just take a handful of the ears, and dry them, meaning it has to be immature barley. And this is an issue because both the Abib of God calendar and the Karaite calendar, they're looking for barley that is basically already hard and dry. So it doesn't need to be dried. But this barley needs to be dried because it needs to be green. In keeping with Strong's Old Testament 24, the barley needs to be tender, young, and green. So they dry the barley, then they beat them small, and purge the barley from the bran. Then they bring one-tenth deal to the altar, to Elohim, and, casting a handful of it upon the fire, they leave the rest for the use of the priest. And then after this, it is that they may publicly or privately reap their harvest. So once again, (laughs) he says, after you bring the wave sheaf offering, that's when you may publicly or privately bring the harvest. So it follows the same pattern. First you bring the wave sheaf, then you can bring in the harvest. First Yeshua is presented, then comes the harvest of the other believers. It follows the same pattern. But the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the rabbis, the Orthodox, and the Karaites, they don't like that pattern. 
because it symbolizes Yeshua. It witnesses to Yeshua. So they have a built-in reason not to want to honor that pattern. That's why Yeshua says, take heed and beware of the leaven, meaning the doctrine of the scribes or the, the Sadducees, this could be the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Because if you're looking for something else, you're going to find something else. It's a very important principle. People need to understand it. So he says, after you bring the Omer, after you bring the wave sheaf, that is when the people may publicly or privately reap their harvest. Okay, well, with that understanding, now let's take a look at the Talmud. And this is more... Now, I, I do not read the Talmud for fun. I, I never I never pick up the Talmud and read it for giggles and laughs. It's just something I look at. To us, it's, it's not an inspired book. It's an important historical reference. It's not an infallible historical reference. There's a lot of problems with the Talmud. So very briefly, we're going to talk about the Talmud. The Talmud is basically a book about rabbinic commentary. Now, it's got two main parts of the document. The core document is called the Mishnah. And then there's the Gemara, which is commentary on the Mishnah. Now, the rabbis allege that the Mishnah was given by Elohim. They believe it was dictated by Yahweh to Moshe at the same time the Torah was handed down in the wilderness of Egypt. But the problem is, it just there's no possible way because it dates to around 515 BCE, which is effectively when Judah came back from Babylon. There's a reason it's called the Babylonian Talmud. Uh, it contradicts scripture in all sorts of ways, in all sorts of places. It doesn't read like scripture. It doesn't have the same spirit as scripture, but it is an interesting historical reference. But we also have to remember that it was redacted. It was meaning it was heavily edited or it was censored around the year 220 CE. Now, if you, this is from Wikipedia, it says, according to rabbinic Judaism, the oral Torah, we're talking about the Talmud, the oral Torah, Torah Shiba'al Peh, was given to Moshe with the Torah. So the oral Torah, the oral tradition was given to Moshe with the Torah. That's not true. At Mount Sinai or Mount Horeb, as an exposition to the latter, meaning it explains. So then that's part of the rabbinical deal is the rabbis will say, you can't understand the Torah without the Talmud. That's kind of like the, the Catholics say, you can't understand scripture without understanding the papal commentaries to scripture. It's the, the same kind of a thing. So it, they say, the accumulated traditions of the oral law, expounded by scholars in each generation from Moses onward, is considered the necessary basis for the interpretation and often for the reading of the written law. Now, let's decipher that. What he's really said, what they're really saying here is they're saying, don't you dare read scripture. And I've I've heard Jews say this. They say, we are taught, do not read the Talmud, excuse me, do not read the Tanakh, do not read the Old Testament without then turning and reading the Talmud to tell you how to interpret it. It's the exact same thing as the Catholics. You're allowed to read, you're sort of discouraged from reading scripture, but you can read scripture. That's okay. Just make sure it doesn't conflict with what the Pope says. Don't, you need to consult the Catholic Church so you can understand scripture. You can understand how to interpret it. You can understand how to understand it. That's the same thing as what they're saying here. So Jews Orthodox, sometimes refer to this as the Masorah, the word Masorah meaning traditions and if we had time, hopefully we'll talk about the Masoretic Hebrew text, meaning the traditional Hebrew text. It's been edited so uh, or redacted, you might say, but it's been heavily, not heavily, it's been edited. For the most part, it's reliable. Uh, we can generally read it and we can understand what, with the few issues and errors there are, we can understand what's going on with it. We'll talk about that in another place. It's not a cause for panic or alarm, but it's something to be aware of for sure. Here's the big problem. Yahweh says not to do that. <laughs> so Deuteronomy chapter four and verse two, for example, Yahweh says, you shall not add to the word which I command you, nor take away from it, that you may keep the commandments of Yahweh, your Elohim, which I command you, meaning 
If you change my word, if you add things to my word or take things away from my word, it's no longer my word. Now it's your word. It's no longer my Torah. It's your Torah. Don't do that. That's exactly what the Talmud is. So he says the same thing in Deuteronomy 12 and verse 32. He says, whatever I command you, be careful to observe it. You shall not add to it nor take away from it. And once again, that's exactly what the Talmud does. So we know that there was no oral Torah for several reasons. So in Exodus 24 and verse 4, it says that Moshe wrote down all the words of Yahweh. Okay, so where is an oral tradition in that? We can't find one. Deuteronomy 5 and verse 22. These words Yahweh spoke to all your assembly in the mountain from the midst of fire, the cloud, and the thick darkness with a loud voice, and he added no more. Where is an oral tradition in that? It doesn't exist. If you're Orthodox Jewish, pay attention to this. Deuteronomy chapter 31 and verse 9. So Moshe wrote this Torah. Where is an oral tradition in that? It doesn't exist. Okay. So moving on, the Talmud, so again, so the core document is the Mishnah and the Gemara is commentary on the Mishnah. And you can always tell the Mishnah because in certain versions, they usually, they put it either in bold or in all caps. We'll see a lot of all caps. Well, there's a very complex and complicated history to the Talmud and we don't want to go through the whole thing because it's just too much. But these are some notes that were passed to me by a brother Yohanan Mershalk. But uh, so those, as I understand it, and from what I've read on the internet also, you have, there were the Tanaim, who were the reciters of tradition. Now the Tanaim, depending upon the source, and there's some overlap in the dates, but you have, you have very various levels and, and generations upon generations upon generations of commentary. But the Tanaim, Lasted the era of the Tanaim lasted from perhaps about 10 CE to about 220 CE. And these are the so-called sages of the Mishnah. So if you ever hear people quoting the sages, that's what they're talking about. And these are the first generation Tanaim. And this includes what you uh, Rabbi Shammai, Rabbi Hillel, Rabbi Gamliel or Gamaliel, we read about in the Renewed Covenant. There's also a Rav Yohanan ben Zakkai. Now, these are what you might call your heavy hitters of heresy. So Yeshua lived in this era. And when we see Yeshua rebuking scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, these are the people he's talking about, are the first generation of the Tanaim. Okay, so the first generation of the Tanaim lasted from about 10 CE until about 220 CE. And that is when Rabbi Yehuda or Judah Hanasi, the prince, Judah the prince, uh, that's when he died. So he lived from approximately 135 to approximately 220 CE, depending upon the source. And then they considered that the Talmud had been redacted around 220 CE. When they say redacted, they mean heavily edited. That means censored. So realistically, probably what happened is Originally, I mean, the Talmud, when you read the Talmud, and we're going to read a little bit of it, it's this rabbi said this, and that rabbi said that, but no, this rabbi disagreed, and that rabbi said it's over here, and somebody says, oh no, that causes a problem. He says, no, it doesn't cause a problem. So if you've ever seen our Orthodox Jewish brothers argue, uh, this is the kind of thing they go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And if you watch, they can start out talking about scripture and then they end up coming to a conclusion that's something completely other else. And you're just like, what is happening? Once again, this is why they call it the Babylonian Talmud. The word Babylon means confusion. So, okay. So the Talmud was redacted, censored, edited <laughs> by Rabbi Judah Hanasi until the year around 220 and he probably removed all the favorable references to Yeshua and the apostles. They probably, you know, as scripture says, these things were not done in a corner. So of course they were recorded, but then of course they had to be edited out. So that's how that goes. So there's lots of contradictions 
The Talmud contradicts scripture a lot. One of the things is that it, the Pharisees, the Orthodox, our Orthodox brethren, they change the date of the wave sheaf offering from the first day of the week following the Passover to the 16th of that month, which they call Nisan. And they also slam the Karaites, whom they call the Boethusians, for disagreeing with them. And we'll see that in just a little bit. Okay. So one of the things is that the wave sheaf represents Yeshua. So why do the Pharisees have a different doctrine? Because they don't want the wave sheaf to represent Yeshua. Because in Matthew 12, in verse 40, Yeshua says, For as Yonah, or Jonah, was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So if the if our Orthodox brethren can change the wave sheaf, because we know that Yeshua was cut off in the middle of the week, as Daniel says, and then he was raised three days later, whether it was at the end of Sabbath or at the start of the first day of the week, he was raised three days and three nights later. And then he was the wave sheaf, symbolic of the wave sheaf, which was always offered on the first day. But if you change, if you as a Pharisee or as an Orthodox Jewish brother, if you change your doctrine to where now the wave sheaf is offered the day after the Passover, well, then it's only a one-day delay. So how does that symbolize, I mean, how does that tie in with Yeshua being raised three days and three nights later? It, it doesn't tie in anymore. So that's why they like to change their doctrine. That's also why the Karaites like to change their doctrine to bring in what they call harvestable fields, is because it undercuts Yeshua's role as the wave sheaf. So now the plot thickens. So let's come back to what Devora, Ms. Gordon said on after her second barley field inspection on the 1st and 2nd of March. She says, also, it has always been understood <laughs> that there was no prohibition against the farmers harvesting when needed, except for that pesky Deuteronomy 16 and verse 9. And she says, they only needed to wait until Yom Hanafat HaOmer, the day of the wave sheaf offering, before eating of the produce. So what she's saying is, you can harvest your barley whenever you like. It's not a big deal. There's never been any prohibition against that historically. So you just can't eat of it until the day of the wave sheaf offering. And I just, I couldn't understand what, you know, what, what is she talking about? Why is this? So I figure, well, you know, she's coming from the Jewish side of the house. So let's take a look in the Talmud and let's see if we can find something that will speak to her, something, some historic reference, something that can help her understand and interpret scripture, because that's what they say is you can't understand and interpret the scriptures without the use of the Talmud. So let's take a look in the Talmud and see what we can find. Okay. So that's what we did. And I came across something that I misunderstood what it was at first. So I came to uh, safaria.com and they have all sorts of books and all kinds of reference materials and this kind of thing from the Jewish side of the house. So we come to the Babylonian Talmud, Sanhedrin 11b and verse 6. Now this is the Davidson edition. This is not the Sonsino. So, and one of the things is that the, the Davidson edition is kind of like what you might call the Amplified. I don't know if you've ever seen the Amplified Bible, but if you read the Amplified Bible, You'll have your Bible verse here, and then they'll have parentheses, and they'll they'll add some things to try to give more emphasis and help you understand what's the ju the general thrust or the gist of the message. So they add things to the text, and this is kind of what the Davidson edition does. I didn't know that. So, but anyway, so I'm reading here in the Talmud in Sanhedrin 11b in verse six in Sepharia. David's edition, it says, the new crop may be harvested and eaten only after the sacrifice of the wave sheaf. I thought, there it is. We'll just send it to Devorah. We'll help her understand. This is great. So I copied it down. I sent her an email along with a lot of other things, not understanding that this was commentary. So I sent her a nice long letter. We'll have it posted on the open letter page. So... <laughs> And she writes back only, this is, this is the sum total of her, <laughs> of her response. She says, you wrote Babylonian Talmud, Sanhedrin 11b, 
The new crop may be harvested and eaten only after the sacrifice of the Omer. It doesn't say that in the text. Devorah. What a nice, friendly letter. What a, what a very helpful, what a, what a wonderful piece of communication from a, another wonderful member of the Barley community who only wants to see the truth established so that everyone can understand what the Torah actually says with regards to the Aviv Barley and the Aviv Barley calendar. Uh, what, a, what a wonderful, uplifting message that was, who we wish it was. So uh, now <laughs> I just want to show you how things read in Safaria. So this is Sanhedrin 11b, the William Davidson Talmud. So this, you know, I'm trying to be, you know, my whole thing is there's a lot of people out there with a lot, and I, I hope I will say this the right way. I would like to ask for prayer for all of these groups. I would like to ask for prayer that there can be unity among the barley community. And I think the only way that that's going to happen is that people need to give up their dogmas. They need to give up their doctrines. And we need to talk about what does scripture say. We can talk about the Talmud. We can talk about historic references, these kinds of things. I found the reference to Josephus very interesting. I sent it to Devora. She didn't want to respond. Okay, so maybe she doesn't like Josephus for whatever reason. He confesses Yeshua. He also actually defected to the Romans. Uh, so I can understand that uh, maybe she doesn't even want to mention him or the rest of my letter or my other letters, many letters. Okay, fine. But, you know, maybe we can talk about can we get together for the barley searches so we can cut out the confusion? We can help people out, this kind of a thing. So I thought, well, you know, we have to... <sighs> so we're going to have to do some research. So here we go. So I'm doing some research. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to safaria.com. I come to Sanhedrin 11b, uh, verse 6, I think it is. And it says, so here's the Hebrew, and it says, the Baraita continues. And now when they've got it in bold, that means that's actually what the Hebrew says. And then the rest of it is added text or supplied text. Like you see a little bit of supplied text in the King James Version. They'll add a word or three. But here, this whoever this rabbi is who's doing this, he's adding sentences to clarify the thing. And I personally agree completely with what he said. So he says, the Baraita continues. And when the ripening of the grain, one of the concerns, everyone is happy. That's in the Hebrew. But then he continues, he adds, since the grain is not yet ripe, the people do not mind waiting an extra month for Nisan or Aviv. If the grain is already ripe, however, et cetera, et cetera, the extra month would simply prolong. And he says, the, simply, the extra month would simply prolong the period during which the grain may not be eaten due to the prohibitions of the new crop. He says, as the new crop may be harvested and eaten only after the sacrifice of the Omer offering on the 16th. 16th is the wrong day, but I thought, wow, there it is. There's our historic reference in the Talmud that you're not allowed to harvest your crops until after the Omer has been offered. Great. Perfect. That's what scripture says. So I sent that to Devorah. She didn't like it. Well, we need to do more research. Okay, so we're not sure about Safaria, so I fall back on the trusty uh, Sonsino edition. And the problem with the Sonsino is the my version, it's uh, built for Windows 95 or something. I've had it a long time. Uh, it crashes when I try to run it on Windows 10, this kind of a thing. But, you know, it, it still works. So I figure, well, you know, there's questions about Davidson, so we'll look it up in Sonsino because Sonsino is the more orthodox of the versions or, you know, what have you. We, we're not trying to be right. We're trying to find out what is right. It's not that we have an agenda. It's that we want to do what Yahweh says. We want to do what scripture says. And if you will talk with us, if you will help us understand, if you'll communicate with us, then maybe we can achieve some kind of unity if that's actually your goal also. <sighs> so, uh, Babylonian Talmud, Menachot 65a, Sonsino edition, now, this is the Mishnah. And again, so it's it's all caps because this is considered... Now, help me out here. If somebody who understands the Mishnah better than I do, please send me an email and help me understand because uh, I have a hard time understanding these as being the words of Elohim. So it says, 
What was the procedure? Now, I don't know why Yahweh is going to ask this question. It doesn't sound like Yahweh to me. He says, what was the procedure? It says, the messengers of the Beit Din used to go out on the day before the festival or the feast and tie the unreaped corn in bunches to make it easier to reap. Now, I have a hard time understanding Yahweh saying this in the wilderness of Sinai. That doesn't make any sense to me, but never mind. We'll just move on. It says, and all the inhabitants of the towns nearby assembled there so that it might be reaped with much display. And maybe I misunderstand what the Mishnah is and hopefully we'll, we'll publish what the Mishnah really says or what, why it's written this way. I have no idea. But I found this passage interesting because this passage says the omer must be the first thing that's cut. That's what I'm getting out of this. You don't bring in the harvest and then bring a sheaf to the priest. It says, the, it's very clear, the omer must be the first thing that is cut. That's why they tie it ahead of the cutting. Okay, so it continues on in the Mishnah, and it says, so they, they talk about a procedure for the cutting, and they say, and why, why are we doing it this way? And, and why was all this? And it says, because of the Boethusians, which was a sect of the Sadducees, just like the Karaites are a sect of the Sadducees. So it says, because of the Boethusians, who maintained that the reaping of the Omer was not to take place at the conclusion of the first day of the festival. So once again, this is the Pharisee, the rabbinical doctrine, is whatever day is the the Passover, that's when the wave sheaf is offered the next day on the first day of unleavened bread. That's how they do it, and there's never a difference. Okay, That's not how it's done. Uh, We talk about that in Aviv, Barley Simplified, and in other places. So, now it gets confusing. It gets difficult. So the Karaites correctly believe that the wave sheaf offering, just like we do, the Karaites correctly believe that the wave sheaf offering takes place on the first day of the week after the Passover week, rather than on the 16th. So whatever day of the week the Passover falls, and you wait until the following first day of the week, that's your wave sheaf offering. That's how the Karaites understand it. That's how we understand it. That's not how the Pharisees or the rabbis understand it. Okay, so moving on. So we come here to Menachot 67b. Uh, you know, and if your head starts to hurt after a while, just remember it's the Babylonian Talmud, it's the confusion Talmud. So the Mishnah says, after the Omer was offered, they, referring to the priests, used to go out, actually it refers to the Beit Din but used to go out and find the market of Jerusalem already full of meal, meaning flour, and parched corn, meaning barley, of the new produce. He says, this, now, again, I have a hard time with this being the words of Yahweh being delivered in the wilderness of Sinai. I don't understand how Yahweh is talking about the market of Jerusalem being already full of meal when they haven't even made it to the land of Israel yet. Maybe that's just me. Again, if you're an expert in the Talmud, help me out, send me an email, and we'll get some clarification on that. But they says, so they offer the Omer, and then they walk out, and the markets are already full. And it says, this, however, did not meet with the approval of the sages. Why? It's obvious why, because if you're going to have already parched barley, what that means is they're actually cutting the barley at the same time as the wave sheaf is being offered. So they're they're bringing in the harvest before the completion of the Omer offering. So this is the Talmud for you. It says, this, however, did not meet with the approval of the sages. So Rabbi Meir, Rabbi Judah says, they did so with the approval of the sages. So again, here's the Talmud. This rabbi says this, and that rabbi says that, and this rabbi disagrees, and that rabbi says, oh, there's a contradiction. Somebody else says there's no contradiction. This goes back and forth, and that's the Talmud for you. Okay. So now we come to Menachot 71a, and this is again Sansino Talmud, and the Mishnah, the document that's allegedly dictated by Elohim so we can understand how to interpret the Torah, allegedly. (laughs) <laughs> okay, he says, one may reap before the omer the corn in irrigated fields in the plain. Okay, so, uh, but one may not stack it. 
Okay, so what they're saying is, if it's an irrigated field, you can reap it, but don't stack it. You just reap it and then leave it to rot. Says Yahweh. You know, <laughs> like they say, truth has got to be stranger than fiction because fiction has got to make sense. Okay, you know, I don't know. Somebody's making this stuff up. Uh, you know, it's not me. So they say the Mishnah, <laughs> allegedly Elohim says, one may reap before the Omer of offering in irrigated fields in the plain, I believe the plain of Jericho probably, but one may not stack it. And then it says, the men of Jericho used to reap before the Omer was offered with the approval of the sages and used to stack it without the approval of the sages, but they did not forbid them. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm having a lot of hard time with this passage here because notice, notice the inherent hypocrisy in what they're saying. What they're saying is, Yahweh says this, the sages agree with Yahweh, the people do the wrong thing, the sages don't reprimand them, so the sages sort of turn a blind eye to the sins of the people, and this is spoken by Yahweh in the wilderness of Sinai or something like that. I don't know. I'm, I'm not responsible. This is not me. This is not my book. This is not my favorite book. But I'm, I'm looking for something to help Devorah understand or else to help myself understand what's going on so we can come to some kind of an understanding within the Barley community. So now we come to Menachot 68a, Sansino Talmud. Once again, the Mishnah. I'm trying to stick to the Mishnah because I just want to stick close to the source. This is considered divine. This is considered inspired by the, by the rabbis. It says, after the Omer was offered, the new corn was permitted forthwith. So as soon as you offer the Omer, now you can have the new stuff. Okay, we're, we're in agreement with that part. It says, but for those that lived far off, it was permitted only after midday. So in other words, if you lived far away from the temple, then you just sort of watched your sundial back in those ancient times, the ancient Timex. And then after midday, now you can reap your crop. Okay. <laughs> so after the temple was destroyed, Rabbi Yohanan ben Zakkai, now remember, he's one of our major heavy hitters of heresy. He's one of our first generation Tanaim. After the temple was destroyed, this is, he's on the same level as Himel, Hillel, Shammai, Gamliel, these guys. So after the temple was destroyed, Rabbi Yohanan ben Zakkai ordained that it should be forbidden to partake of the crop throughout the day of the waving. Okay, so good idea. Now, why is he suggesting this? Is because they have the wrong, they have the wrong interpretation. But this is how the rabbis work. So they have the wrong interpretation. So what they're they're saying, you know, you're they're they're offering the omer. They're coming out from offering the omer. The marketplace is already full of all this stuff that's been harvested before the omer was offered or during the time the omer was being offered or something like that. Um, so Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, first generation Tanaim, he's uh, forbidding this for whatever reasons, and the Talmud explains those reasons. It gets complicated. I think we'll forget about it, but you get the idea. Okay, now we're going to come to Safaria and the Davidson Talmud. I looked for it in Sansino. I couldn't find it. We come to the Babylonian Talmud, Safaria Davidson edition, Rosh Hashanah, 30a, verse 23. It says, if the people eat the new grain at midday, they will have retroactively transgressed a prohibition. What does that mean? <laughs> it means that they would be transgressing because the barley that was eaten at midday had to be harvested before midday, before the omer was properly offered. Therefore, Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai instituted that the new grain should be prohibited for the entire day of the 16th. Good idea. Okay. But notice again what they're doing. They're changing things so they can add things and subtract things. And they have all kinds of discussion. You go, I mean, this goes on and on and on about 
this rabbi said this about what Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai said, and that rabbi said that about ra- rabbi. And it's just like four or five pages of this stuff. And it's just like, ay, 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 why don't they just follow Deuteronomy 16 and verse 9? Then we don't have this problem. Oy va voy. Okay. So here's my questions with regard to all this. Why did your, did Josephus, who lived in the first century, say he was he was a witness? Why did this first century witness say that the Omer had to be offered first? And why does the Talmud, which was redacted or edited or heavily censored until the year 220 CE, over a hundred years later, almost 200 years later, why does the Talmud say that you can harvest early? Another question. When Judah Hanasi censored out all the references to Yeshua and the apostles, is it possible that he censored any opinions that might say that the Omer had to be brought first? Such as said witnesses like Josephus. Some more questions. The Karaites allegedly reject the Talmud. But if the Karaites reject the Talmud, then why are they secretly referencing the Talmud? Why are they secretly following the, tradu- the Talmudic traditions contained in the Talmud? In other words, if the, ta- if the Karaites are truly obeying Scripture and not the Talmud, then why are the Karaites saying it's okay to break Deuteronomy 16 and verse 9 to start the cutting before you start the counting just so long as you don't eat of the crop? Because the Talmud says it's okay? Because this is what Devorah is referring to. She's saying, it has always been understood that there was never a prohibition. There was no prohibition against harvesting the crop early. Only a prohibition against eating of that crop. Why is she doing this? Because the Talmud says so. I don't know. It's a question I'm asking. More questions. Why do Devor's date tree and the equinox people, we'll talk about a beam of God, hopefully next week. That's a whole separate kettle. Why do Devor's date tree and the equinox people not seem to care that we already have broken and shattered barley on the ground at least 16 days prior to their wave sheaf offering on the 4th of April? Actually, in reality, it's closer to a month. Does this mean nothing to them? This is what I asked in the letter. Does it mean nothing to you that, that, that you have broken and shattered barley on the ground? It's not your field. What do you care? Why is that? I don't know. It's a good question, I think. So now, final question. Even if the rabbis condoned breaking Deuteronomy 16 and verse 9 in the past, and this hypocrisy, this Torah breaking, this sin, this flagrant disobedience to the words of Elohim just happens to be recorded in the Talmud, does that mean we should do the same thing? Just because they sinned back in the Talmud times, does that mean that we get to sin also? And in particular, if we can show in Aviv Barley Simplified and in these other videos that there's a better way to do this that does not require breaking Deuteronomy 16 and verse 9, then why not do it that way? Especially when it gives a witness to Yeshua's role as the Omer. Or perhaps is that why we're specifically not doing it is because it gives a witness to Yeshua's role as the Omer? It's a question I'm asking. So why don't we do things Yahweh's way? He says, Deuteronomy 16 and verse 9, you shall count seven weeks for yourself. Begin to count the seven weeks from the time you begin to put the sickle to the standing grain. Then keep your feast. 
So begin to count when you begin to cut. Begin to cut when you begin to count. What's wrong with doing it the way Yahweh says? To sum it up, if the Karaites do not believe in the Talmud, why are the Karaites secretly following the traditions recorded in the Talmud? Is there perhaps some special link between the Pharisees and the Sadducees that maybe we don't know about today? It's a question I'm asking. So thank you for joining us for the curious, curious history, curious and curiouser of Aviv Barley in 2021 CE. Thank you for learning about Josephus, the Talmud, and the Omer. Shalom.